what I was asked to do was speak about minimally invasive options uh, for patients with spine tumors and uh, avoid uh, everything but uh, radiosurgery, but it's impossible today to talk about minimally invasive treatments without talking about radiosurgery, so I'll uh, talk a little bit about that uh, later. But uh, just a little bit about Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh is a uh, history, a long history of uh, innovations. So that's where I come from and where I trained and where I practice now. We have, it's also called the City of Bridges, but where we have the Uber uh, self-driving cars that are everywhere and people are surprised when they think that there are five or ten of them but there's a whole fleet and you see them driving around all the time and it's really we say if you can drive in Pittsburgh you can drive a anywhere so that's why they're there. Still so, right now? Yes absolutely. The Arizona yes uh, we can talk about that later that's because they're regulated on a state level so uh, the governor said to keep going so yes so they are still going strong and there's never been an accident in Pittsburgh that I'm aware of <coughs> so uh, talking about the, the multimodality treatment of spine tumors you have to think about every you know 10 years ago 20 years ago we just we were surgeons talking to ourselves or radiation oncologists talking to ourselves or radiologists talking to ourselves but now we have to talk about all these modalities we're trying to avoid major open surgery. We know that the morbidity to operate on these patients is very, very high. Not all cases can be treated with a radiosurgery. We have to talk about open techniques, but we have to. Tr the, there has been a trend towards percutaneous techniques and really a renewed focus on mechanical pain, as we've talked about with the SIN score. So, a background about the a uh, trend towards MIS or minimally invasive spine surgery in spine oncology. It's been an evolution in all of surgery to avoid major open surgeries and such techniques really follow a natural trend in surgery. There's been significant interest in adopting these techniques in the field of sp uh, spine oncology oncology, but ultimately the goals are the same. We have to decompress the neural elements and then we have to stabilize the spine. What we, when we got excited 20 years ago about putting all these rods and screws in and even talking about on-block resections of metastatic disease, we quickly realized that the morbidity to operate on these patients is very high. We know that these are some of the most sick patients in, in the hospital. They have had prior radiation. They have poor nutrition. They've had, they're on systemic chemotherapy agents. Now the immunotherapy agents, they don't do well with major open surgeries. So we can, if we can avoid surgery, we can. So today, even this morning, we were talking about, about doing prophylactic vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty in patients with uh, fractures before we, tr we treat with radiotherapy or other treatments. But that seems like a common concept now, but 15 years ago or 20 years ago, there was an initial incredible fear about doing cement augmentation procedures for pathologic fractures as opposed to osteoporotic fractures. And it was, this was one of the uh, seminal uh, cases uh, publications in 2003 from uh, MD Anderson and, and Johns Hopkins where they looked at patients in these are small numbers of patients 56 patients in the cohort where they found kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty to be feasible safe and durable so with some trepidation for the for the surgeons and their interventional radiologists we started treating these patients with cement. This was from a, the European experience about the same time in 2004, not that long ago, where they found with balloon kyphoplasty, they looked at Oswestry scores and uh, visual analog scores, and they found that both pain and quality of life can be improved greatly in these patients. How about there was um, how about patients that have significant destruction of the vertebral body? So this was a subsequent study that supported the use for pathologic fractures. This was an MD Anderson and a very interesting concept where they looked at patients that despite being contraindicated uh, 20 years ago or 10 years ago for rate for kyphoplasty, they went ahead and they treated those patients with the cement and they found it once again to be safe and effective. And this really opened up the procedure to many hundreds of thousands of patients. Once again, going back to uh, Europe in the German experience in 2007, looking at balloon kyphoplasty where they found similar to the osteoporotic literature, 
that they could improve the vertebral body height and even improve the kyphotic deformity in these patients with pathologic compression fractures. And it prevented further kyphotic deformity. So all of a sudden, we could treat these patients with a deformity, with mechanical pain, and avoid open surgery. We all felt that there had to be a large multi-institutional trial. Back in 2009, uh, this was an article that Udi and I, I think the first that we ever wrote together, where we looked in 2009, what was the evidence in, for the pathologic fractures? There were 28 articles for vertebroplasty, 12 articles for kyphoplasty, and there were data to support performing these procedures in pathologic fractures. And this was the percutaneous techniques for the treatment of spine tumors back in 2009 showed that there was strong recommendation and moderate evidence for using vertebral augmentation procedures to alleviate pain, improve function, and avoid secondary compression fractures. Be then all of a sudden, as uh, surgeons, <coughs> we took this one step further. We were trying to <coughs> excuse me, incorporate these uh, percutaneous techniques with other minimally invasive techniques that we had the ability to, to perform, such as percutaneous screw augmentation procedures. But we got together and we said there had to be class one evidence. So there was the CAFE study, the cancer patient fracture evaluation that provided class one evidence. It was published in 2011 in Lancet Oncology. And as you can see here, and I'll go in, in greater detail in a moment, but that for patients that did not undergo cement augmentation, as we all know now, their pain does not improve even with radiation or with systemic therapies. So this was class one evidence looking at a large cohort, 22 sites in Europe, the United States, Canada, and Australia. The major inclusion criteria, all the patients that we see on a daily basis, adults with significant pain scores, one to three fractures. The major exclusion criteria, the patients that had spinal cord compression, we know today those patients need either radiotherapy or open surgery. But they took these patients and then they randomized them. <coughs> And once again, what they found is that patients, when you do these cases, it is very, very safe, and their pain goes down almost immediately. At our institution, the vast majority of these patients are treated in an outpatient setting. There's no reason to bring them into the hospital. They report within seven days significant improvement, and most importantly, it is a sustained improvement. Once you get their pain under control, this does not go back, not come back, unless the tumor grows and causes further problems. They looked at Roland Morris, a disability score at one month, and we all of the standard looking at Karnofsky, the performance status increases if you take care of these pain. And the most important take home message from the CAFE study for all of you to take home is that if you perform these kyphoplasties or cement augmentation procedures, it doesn't really matter how you put the cement in, they improve no matter what criteria they improve. If you take these patients and you don't perform, nothing improves in these patients. They simply do not get better. They don't tolerate bracing. They don't tolerate non-surgical treatments. Um, and with an as-treated analysis, these patients do very good. And once again, they maintain their outcomes. This is not a temporary improvement. They maintain their improvement through 12 months. The pain continues to be improved. So how do we treat these patients and when? So this is a patient with metastatic renal cell carcinoma, has an upper, uh, upper lumbar, lower thoracic isometastic. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Great. Just what the doctor ordered, right? Sorry. And how do, does this patient, excuse me, so this patient with a renal cell oligometastasis has a clear fracture, but this patient has, is metastatic breast cancer, has had prior radiotherapy, and has these fractures here. Which one deserves a kyphoplasty? Well, you have to go back and you have to look at the patient. The patient on the left has no pain. They had a recurrent um, 
tumor. We simply treated that with radiosurgery because they had prior radiation. This patient here on the right with a woman with breast cancer, we couldn't tell if it was uh, radiation-induced osteopenia or active tumor, so we did a kyphoplasty, got rid of her pain. And this is what we talk about with the SIN score. We talked about this earlier in, in a way to determine spinal instability. So many of us got together almost a decade ago and we said we need an easy score so that anyone, a radiologist, a medical oncologist, a radiation oncologist, an experienced surgeon, we were all talking about who had a, who has instability and who doesn't. And just to summarize, we can tell with these patients who are good candidates for percutaneous cement augmentation and they can avoid open surgery. So that patients in the upper level with <coughs> a, uh, compression fractures, we can treat with cement alone. In the middle, they have a more of a mechanical deformity, kyphosis. Those patients need instrumentation. And then in the lower, with a significant deformity, spinal cord compression, those patients need, they need an open decompression and an instrumented fusion. Just a word about the two types of pain. It was asked before who gets, who should get vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty, who should just get radiotherapy or systemic therapy or no therapy at all. The difference between mechanical pain and biological pain. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it really didn't matter because we didn't tailor our treatments. But now it's very, very important for patients with classic mechanical pain, and we all knew who these patients are. It hurts when they move, it hurts when they get out of bed. Those require cement augmentation or open surgery. Biological pain is usually pain at night uh, when their endogenous steroids goes down. Those patients do not necessarily need cement augmentation. Now we've worked so hard that the National Comprehensive Cancer Network guidelines have included, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, where you can see vertebral augmentation for fracture spinal instability. And if there's no fracture spinal instability, then we can talk about radiotherapy or radiosurgery. Now, how about, so this just includes the guidelines for when to use cement augmentation in these procedures. That there's a gr general consensus of when to use it and when to not. not. And how about combining this with radiosurgery with cement augmentation? Because the issue is a patient has cancer, they've uh, a metastasis, it's weakened the bone, the bone has fractured, you need to get rid of the pain, you put cement in, but you still have tumor there. So you need to follow that up with radiosurgery, and that is the paradigm at our institution and many institutions. You put the cement in first, you get a diagnosis, a histological diagnosis, you can look at the biological markers, you can fix their mechanical pain, and then you can subsequently treat with radiotherapy, or in this case, radiosurgery. An example of a woman with metastatic renal cell carcinoma, 20 years ago, as I tell the residents, this was a death sentence for these patients. They wouldn't live more than six months or a year. But now at an L1 level, we performed a kyphoplasty and then we followed this up with 22 gray in a single fraction. I just got a letter from her two weeks ago. That's why I included this case. She's playing golf down in South Carolina six years later, no evidence of disease because our medical oncology colleagues have immunotherapies now that are so successful to treat these patients. And now moving on from just putting in cement. Our early experience, we were very excited. We put cement into these patients and many of them got better, but many times you just had a patient with a big ball of cement right in the middle of vertebral body and their pain didn't get better. So we knew we had to somehow cavitate out that tumor <coughs> to remove the tumor so that you can get the cement into the end plates. And this was an early uh, technology we used with a cavitation wand. But others were using radiofrequency ablations. And this was back in 2004, a decade ago. People, uh, most of these were interventional radiologists. They got excited about using different types of RF catheters. Now, this was an article looking at different types of bony metastases. Only four of these in this series were vertebral body lesions. But people got excited and said, I can combine radiofrequency. I have a catheter. It's already in the tumor. I'm going to kill the tumor and then place cement. And these were several of the early articles. 
But we realized our RF catheters had to be uh, become much better. And this was the technology developed specifically for the vertebral body because in the past, sometimes we were using ones that were used for liver cancer or prostate metastasis or prostate cancer. So this was the STAR system. It was a navigational thermal ablation, si ablation system where it was angled so you can place it right down the pedicle into the vertebral body. Um, and this was some of the uh, studies supporting RFA for spinal metastases. There's a growing body of literature. Now, more recently, there is the LIT, <coughs> which is, um, the, is using laser interstitial thermotherapy. Uh, now, for the neurosurgeons in the audience, we're using a lot of this for brain lesions for epilepsy. It's very, very successful for a variety of reasons, but several centers have pushed this to use in the spine because what you can do is you can take tumors down here that are not amenable to uh, radiosurgery because the tumor is compressing upon the nerve, but you can place it through the pedicle, shrink the tumor, and then make it into a case amenable to open radiosurgery. I think on the right you can see that. And that was just called the LIT procedure. The problem is a little bit cumbersome because it requires intraoperative uh, MR imaging. Most recently now, there's the osteocool RF ablation system and, and some of the gentlemen out here, I didn't know that they were going to be here today from Medtronic. This is a newer system that's been out for about uh, two or three years where it's using a cooled RF system that is it's very easy. It's the same as putting a, a cement augmentation, vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty going into both pedicles and then you can measure the pedicles here and measure the vertebrae a vertebral body, and then based upon the size, you can put these catheters in and um, and cool using a cooling technique to kill the tumor. Once again, very, very safe, very, very effective. So it's really a one-two punch. You're putting, you're not just putting cement in the middle of a tumor, you're killing the, the tumor, you're blading the tumor, and then you're augmenting with c cement. And this is just a little bit more technical about how it's perhaps better using a cooling system than a non-cooled system because there are complications, risk of using a, a heat-generated RFA system. So to summarize, all of a sudden we are, try we are using these as surgical tools. It's no longer as a surgeon I say, I'm going to put rods and screws in this patient, then I'm going to send them to an interventional radiologist to do their thing, and then the medical oncologist to do their thing, and the radiation oncologist to do their thing. It's multimodality so that we're looking at these patients and performing neo-adjuvant therapy. We're, we're removing tumor, we're placing cement, we're killing the tumor, we're, de we're decreasing the tumor burden and so that we can, the patient can be treated with systemic therapy. So in summary, as physicians who care for patients with spine tumors, we need to understand the indications, the contraindications, and the limitations to these percutaneous procedures. And we're really just at the tip of the iceberg. Every year, there's newer and newer technology. There's more literature to support the use of these technologies. Thank you very much.